October 19, 1946, Princeton University celebrated its 200th Charter Day. In 1746, under the seal of George II, the original charter was granted. The university was founded, and seven years later, plans for Nassau Hall were drawn up. Now, on this bright October morning, two centuries later, a great university pauses to look back upon a long and honorable history of useful service to the United States and the world. Part of the ceremonies of celebration, distinguished scholars from all parts of the world came to pay their respects and to deliver the greetings of their institutions. The long line marched from Nassau to the University Chapel, where the chart day exercises were held. In it were delegates from the United Nations, headed by the Secretary General Tryggve Lee of Norway. In the procession also were representatives of learned societies, of foreign academies as well as nearby institutions. The living history of Princeton was represented by men of classes from 1881 to 1950, by the faculty and trustees, and by President Harold W. Dodds, shown here with New Jersey's governor, the Honorable Walter E. Edge. In the places of honor were 23 internationally known scholars who received honorary degrees. These included Niels Bohr, the great Danish physicist, Salvador de Madariaga, Spanish writer, Jacques Maritain, French philosopher, and Norway's Tryggve Lee, Secretary General of the United Nations. The 23 recipients of honorary degrees pose on the steps of Nassau Hall. In the afternoon, Princeton's Charter Day guests joined 40,000 spectators in Palmer Stadium to witness the Rutgers-Princeton football game. It was the 38th meeting between these old New Jersey rivals, who played way back in 1869, what is considered to have been the first game of intercollegiate football. Rutgers, with a well-balanced and thoroughly experienced team, was favored to win. But in the first quarter, Princeton's Val Wagner, number 42, throws a pass to Ed Meek, and the Tigers move into Rutgers territory. Paul White, number 33, Princeton's fullback, rips the center of the line for 10 big yards. Once again, Wagner fades to pass. This one to Ernie Ransom, who delivers to the Rutgers four-yard line just as the quarter ends. Changing goals, the ball is given to White. He crashes the line, fumbles, but cleverly recovers in mid-air. This time, White goes over. But in the stands, there is considerable confusion. Is it a touchdown or isn't it? One of the officials had detected an infraction of the rules. Rutgers offside. The touchdown counts, and Princeton leads seven to nothing. In the third period, though, Rutgers roars right back with this rather fancy pass completion, helping to sustain the scarlet march. Rutgers' tricky offense opens up still wide. A flanker grabs a flat pass on a play that crossed up the orange and black defenders to put the ball on the 26-yard strike. Calling for an off-tackle play, Rutgers drives to Princeton's 11 as the third period ends. Opening the fourth quarter, Rutgers Malikoff finds a hole in the Tiger line and goes over to tie the score. With only three minutes left to play, the irrepressible Wagner fires a pass to Tom Finnickel that eats up 29 precious yards. It's to
to be another Wagner pass. A long one, and it's good to me to set up Princeton's winning touchdown. Palmer Stadium that day read in their programs about the original Rutgers-Princeton game 77 years before. And it seemed more than fitting on Princeton's charter day to restage this historic and pioneer date in American college athletics. So let us look back on that day, November 6th, 1869, when intercollegiate football was born. Under the direction of a bicentennial subcommittee, members of the theater and team and Rutgers soccer players reenact the scene for us. The arrival of the players looked more like a mob scene than an organized sport. And it's safe to say that not one of those high-spirited boys realized what they were starting, a game that was to thrill millions in generations to follow. But even then, the cheering sections were dandies. There were no uniforms, no pads, no headgear in those days. The boys simply draped their coats over a convenient fence and were ready for battle. There were 24 players on each side for this first of all football games. Beyond that, the rules, if any, were rather sketchy. Here's the kickoff, history in the making. The first injury and first aid from a reconstructed beauty. Here, you followers of the modern game, is something you've heard about but probably have never seen. The famous flying wedge. The Rutgers ball carrier is there in the middle somewhere, while his teammates form a V-shaped juggernaut that runs down and crushes everything and everybody in its path. It's all very informal. Again, Princeton kicks off, and again, Rutgers maneuvers to form the awesome wedge. Aha, time out, so as the artist can put this historic event onto canvas. Then, when play resumes, an unidentified Princeton hero blasts the mighty wedge and recovers the ball. Now, Old Nassau begins its first football offensive, going for the first touchdown in a long and glorious parade of Princeton touchdowns through the years. Princeton celebrated the 200th anniversary of the granting of its charter. This was the first of several events which were to be held during the bicentennial year to mark the end of its second century and the beginning of the third. In its 200 years, Princeton University has acquired many traditions dear to the hearts of all the men who have gone from its campus to useful places in the world's work. <laughs> 